Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Friday seminars. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, Dr. Yuchi Go from Columbia University. Uh, Yuchi is an assistant professor there at the Department of Statistics. And before that, she received her PhD in statistics from the University of Michigan. And then she also did a quick one year postdoc at Duke with David Johnson. Uh, she has very general research interests uh, in latent variable models, statistical machine learning, and psychometrics. And some of her specific research interests are in uh, discrete latent structures, uh, tensor decompositions, multivariate categorical data, graphical models, among other things. Uh, and she has already done lots of good work in all these areas that have appeared in top journals. And today she's going to tell us about some of her recent interesting work on so-called Bayesian pyramids uh, on multi-layer discrete latent structure models for discrete data. Please join me in welcoming you. Yeah. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And uh, uh, thank you, Anirban, for uh, inviting me here. It's really my great pleasure to speak at the statistics seminar at Texas A&M. Uh, today, I'm uh, going to talk about my recent work on Bayesian pyramids, an identifiable family of multi-layer discrete latent structure models. So this is based on joint work with David Johnson from Duke University. So uh, briefly speaking, the latent variable models are a family of models uh, with unobserved constructs. And traditionally, on one hand, they have been very popular in social and behavioral sciences. For example, to model uh, unobserved uh, substantive constructs, such as personality in psychology or skills in education. But on the other hand, in recent years, latent variable models have also been attracting a lot of interest in machine learning and deep learning. So they can serve as uh, powerful dimension reduction tools and uh, latent structures are also building blocks for uh, some deep learning models. So I will be talking about a uh, family of latent variable models and I want to give it a context uh, within this general family. So uh, latent variable models can be basically <clears throat> divided into four types based on the nature of the observed and the latent variable. So for example, uh, the most familiar factor analysis model is using uh, continuous latent variables to model continuous observations. So in other cells of this table are also some respective uh, popular models. In my talk, I will be focusing on the bottom right cell of this table, that is using categorical latent variables to model categorical observations. So traditionally, uh, there's a so-called latent class model that is a, a canonical choice falling in this cell. So latent class model was proposed by sociologists in 1950s, uh, firstly to model the survey response data. And uh, it is assuming that there's a univariate discrete latent variable, C, that renders conditional independence of multiple discrete outcome variables. So Y1 through uh, Yp here. And uh, in this graphical model representation, the white nodes are latent variables and the gray nodes are observed variables. So such a simplistic structure is not flexible enough to model uh, modern complex data sets. So there are uh, following several uh, examples of desirable features to model uh, modern data. So one is it is desirable to adopt a multi-dimensional latent structure so that we can capture multiple different aspects of data. For example, uh, I work on, uh, I initially was motivated to work on latent variable models from an educational application where the different latent variables can capture the different skills that a uh, exam wants to measure. Therefore, uh, the multidimensionality of the latent uh, skills uh, is usually uh, an interest of practitioners. And the second desirable feature to consider is the sparse graphical dependence in the model. So for example, uh, not, the, not all the latent variables are connected to, to each observed variable. So such sparse graphical dependence between the latent and the observed layer can greatly enhance the interpretation of the model and also uh, encourage better um, interpretation. And uh, finally, an important aspect we want to consider is uh, the deep latent structure. How to use deep latent structure to model complex and high dimensional modern data sets. 
So we know that deep learning has achieved great success across many disciplines and many applications. And especially the supervised uh, deep learning, where we have an outcome of interest and we have predictors. So that is a relatively well understood problem. Um, but the unsupervised setting, where we want to understand the joint distribution of multiple uh, and potentially high dimensional uh, variables without an outcome in mind. So this problem is generally considered more vague and also more challenging. So in this talk, we want to provide a, uh, want to propose a family of discrete latent structure models. Uh, and uh, we want to propose a deep latent structure that is interpretable, uh, reliable, and uh, re reproducible. So that is our um, uh, general uh, goal here. So this is a glance at uh, our proposed model, the Bayesian pyramids. So mm, this is a class of potentially deep directed graphical model consisting of discrete random variables. So uh, the name Bayesian comes from the fact that uh, we consider a directed graphical model. So these type of models are also equivalently called Bayesian networks in the literature. And uh, the name pyramid uh, actually reflects the specific deep architecture that we're considering. So it is a pyramid structure with fewer and fewer latent variables when going deeper. And later we will see this uh, is not uh, arbitrarily designed, but actually uh, exactly motivated by our identifiability considerations or interpretability considerations. So in this bottom layer, uh, we can see there are gray nodes. So they are observed uh, responses for P uh, random variables. And all the deeper layers, they are white nodes, so they are uh, latent variables. And we consider all the variables to be discrete. So the research questions we want to address are twofold. The first is theoretically what and uh, when and what discrete latent structures can give rise to an identifiable model. Yes? The last slide, there is an subject. Mm -hmm. I do not see N in this block. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking that. So this is a graphical model illustration where each random variable uh, actually will have their uh, subject-specific realizations. So for example, if we have a sample of N subjects, then each of these subjects will have their realizations of the uh, p-dimensional responses at the bottom. So uh, therefore, you can consider uh, the data is a matrix with N rows and P columns. So each row is a realization of the observed variable. And all the white nodes are unknown, and, uh, but they are also subject specific. So for each subject, there's a, a latent variable. This subject can be seen with a tree structure, and there are n leaves on the tree. Um, uh, it's here the number of leaves. If we, uh, so first, um, I think um, our, Architecture is more general than a tree because it is a DAG. We allow each node to have multiple parents. And the second, the number of, uh, the number of nodes in the bottom layer is P, is not N. So uh, for each of the N subjects, they will have their own realization of this P-dimensional random variable. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So um, identifiability, this concept uh, is uh, actually a fundamental concept in uh, statistics. As we know, it just refers that based on the observed data distribution, we can uniquely identify uh, some qualities. And this is a, a fundamental prerequisite for valid statistical inference, because if we do not, if we cannot uniquely identify uh, the parameters or the latent structures, we cannot reliably use them uh, in downstream analysis. Uh, but with latent variables, the identifiability problem can be quite challenging to address. And uh, uh, the second question we want to address is the methodology question. That is, if we know what kind of latent structure model is identifiable, then how should we infer the latent structure and estimate the parameters? So we will be um, uh, first considering the identifiability problem. So uh, here's a bit more detail about the Bayesian pyramid formulation. Uh, as we said before, uh, there are uh, if we are given a sample, then there are n subjects. Now let's uh, just uh, conceptually consider that the distribution of the p-dimensional random variables. So it actually allows such a directed graphical model representation. 
So uh, according to the conventional definition of a directed graphical model, we have that the distribution of each variable depends only on its parents. And the parent is in the sense that if there's a directed edge from this alpha one to y one, then uh, this alpha is called a parent of y one. And as we can see from this uh, toy example, the parents of all the observed variables yj's can be uh, summarized as the dark red edges between the bottom two layers. And we can equivalently summarize this by parted graph between the bottom two layers as a, a binary adjacency matrix. So this is a graphical matrix. It has p rows corresponding to the p uh, variables in the bottom and k1 columns corresponding to the k1 uh, variables uh, in this latent layer. So each entry is a binary indicator of whether the corresponding latent variable is a parent of the corresponding uh, observed variable. So uh, in a similar fashion, we can also summarize the bipartite graph dependence between the shallowest latent layer and the deeper latent layer in another graphical matrix G2. So this G2 has K1 rows and K2 columns defined in similar fashion as the G1. And again, uh, according to the convention, uh, conventional distribution of a probabilistic directed graphical model, we can write out the distribution of the observed layer, even the shallowest latent layer, as a factorization of conditional distributions. And uh, also, uh, this means we can write out the joint distribution for all the random variables in this graph, uh, just uh, according to the factorization of the parent-child relationships. And after that, recall that uh, all these white nodes are unobserved. So after we get the joint distribution of all the variables, we can marginalize out all the latent variables to obtain the marginal distribution of the observables. So you can imagine uh, after such a marginalization, the resulting distribution for the observables can be quite flexible, quite rich, especially when we're building up the depth. And another uh, uh, accompanying problem, of course, is the identifiability can be uh, challenging because we have multiple layers, we have sparse connections between layers. So that's, uh, uh, I first uh, want to talk about uh, our uh, main result first before talking about our intuition or our strategy of establishing such a result. Okay, so because this result is uh, actually quite transparent and can be understood in terms of the graph structure. Okay, so our uh, identifiability conditions are actually um, conditions about this between layer graphical matrices. So uh, using certain algebraic techniques, we were able to show that as long as each binary graphical matrix, GM, so uh, the superscript M denotes that we are considering the M Slayton layer and the layer above it, okay? So uh, as long as each of this GM matrix contains three copies of identity submatrices, and uh, uh, there can be some additional row vectors that uh, can take arbitrary form, but uh, as long as each graphical matrix takes this form, then under some very mild conditions, uh, we can establish the identifiability of the entire model, which includes not only the uh, conditional probability distributions, but also the graph themselves, like how these uh, dark red edges or the dark blue edges should grow are also identifiable. So uh, let's take a moment to understand the graphical uh, translation of these conditions. So since the graphical matrix G1, G2, et cetera, they are just summarizing how the bipartite graph between adjacent layers should grow. So our conditions on each GM can be translated to graphical requirement. It's, uh, it's specifically, our condition is requiring that for each latent variable, uh, no matter which layer it is in, for each latent variable, it needs to have at least three pure children in the graph in order for uh, this structure to be satisfied. So that means as long as each latent variable has three pure children, and uh, we can have some additional nodes that, uh, for example, this node is not a pure children of any variable, but actually has two parents, right? We can allow this stack structure. And uh, uh, under this uh, graphical constraint, we can uh, prove the identifiability of the entire degenerative model. 
So uh, there's an implication of such a condition. As you might have noticed, since we require each latent variable to have at least three pure children, that means the number of uh, variables when going one layer deeper should be at most uh, decrease as p over three, right? Uh, the K1 has a natural upper bound, which is P over three, and K2 has a natural upper bound, which is K1 over three. So that actually uh, directly indicates uh, a shrinking uh, pyramid or shrinking ladder structure when going deeper. And uh, that is partly why we call this is a pyramid. Okay, so yeah. So your Einstein variable doesn't depend in any way terms of how many levels, so I assume you have variables at this rate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so how many levels they can take, does that play any role in your idea? Yeah, thanks for uh, asking that. I should have mentioned that in the uh, preprint that this talk is based on, we actually assumed that the, the latent variables are all binary, so each variable is binary. But actually, we currently, uh, we have uh, extended the result to uh, uh, latent variables that can take arbitrary number of uh, uh, categories. So because the uh, three here doesn't really uh, rely on the binary nature of the latent variable. Yeah, so that's a great question. Yes? So the number of layers, I mean, uh, K and the M are fixed in the layer here. Uh, the K, so here. Uh, so, we, so, so we fix the number of layers and the number of uh, nodes that we before. Yeah, 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 that's true. So when we established this identifiability, we assumed the knowledge of the K1, K2, this number. But uh, this condition, uh, because it is not very far from being necessary, so this condition actually uh, also inspires that in practice, our K1, K2 should have a natural upper bound. Yeah, but we fix it for now in this, uh, in this work. So uh, one thing I want to uh, mention at this point is that our conditions can actually accommodate uh, various distributional assumptions. Although we are considering discrete variables, but uh, we still allow for different uh, various uh, distributional assumptions uh, in the graphical model. So uh, for example, um, one uh, popular way to specifying the distribution of a binary variable given its parents is to use a generalized linear model where the latent parents just serve as the linear predictors inside a generalized linear link. And uh, uh, this is, uh, of course, allowable uh, in our uh, result. And uh, we also allow for more parsimonious distribution. Uh, for example, um, the Boolean factorization uh, has a more parsimonious parameterization and actually has only two levels for each uh, latent variable. Uh, it is not a linear combination uh, existing in the distribution, but actually some interaction effect. But it's also uh, allowable and our conditions are still sufficient for guaranteeing identifiability. So also we can allow for more complicated models that include both the main effect, the linear effect, and also the interaction effect. So in nutshell, uh, this means our result applies as long as this graphical structures are respected. That means uh, in probabilistic graphical model, that means the conditional independence uh, implied by these graphs are respected. So as long as these are met, uh, we can apply our results. Um, so there are uh, some connections with the models that we consider and some existing models of uh, with discrete latent variables. So first is in psychometrics. Um, people have uh, considered in a family of cognitive diagnostic models. Uh, actually, this first motivated me to look at uh, such latent structures at first. So they are, they, are, they are interested in diagnosing the presence or absence of multiple fine-grained skills, but they are usually confirmatory in nature. That means they know the graphical dependence before they analyze the data. Uh, however, uh, we consider exploratory settings here where we don't know uh, the edges between different layers, but we identify them uh, directly. And also uh, there haven't been deep uh, multi-layer structures considered in this uh, field. Uh, on the other hand, in machine learning, the deep belief networks and the deep Boltzmann machines are actually uh, popular deep generative models that consist of binary latent variables and uh, binary observations. So in a sense, this is quite similar to our consideration, but uh, the identifiability issue is uh, typically ignored there. So people just use this 
deep uh, architectures for prediction. They want to build a good prediction model for the observed outcome at the bottom layer, but they don't uh, consider or don't care um, too much about uh, what kind of structure is uniquely identifiable. So if we are like just using the model for image classification, et cetera, so identifiability may not be a uh, most important thing, but if we want to apply such models uh, in uh, like more substantive science, for example, in uh, biomedical science, in social science, um, each latent uh, variable may carry a substantive meaning and being able to identify these parameters and the latent structures will be of uh, important practical value. So that's the uh, a brief uh, connection or uh, discussion. Yes. So I have a question regarding the interpretation. So you mentioned the identifiability is matters when we want to interpret the latent factors. Mm -hmm. But how should we interpret more deeper layers in the context? Like, is this something like a factor of factor? Is a factor? So is this uh, kind of deep hierarchy? So yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, uh, for example, uh, if we consider uh, in education setting where people generally have only considered the one layer, but they have considered that this one layer is very fine grained skills. For example, uh, some skill is doing fraction, some uh, skill is doing uh, subtraction. But uh, if we can have a deeper architecture, then these deeper layers uh, with fewer latent variables can represent less specific and more high level skills, for example, algebra, geometry uh, at this level. And actually at deeper level, it can represent even higher and more abstract uh, skills like uh, math mathematics and science. Yeah, this is actually uh, one of the motivating settings that we are considering. That is, uh, when going deeper, uh, the level of uh, abstractions becomes uh, bigger and we have uh, we can learn more and more abstract features so this uh, observation is also actually empirically observed for topic models so some people have considered deep topic models and they do observe when going deeper uh, the uh, the fewer topics are, are actually more general uh, concepts okay uh, is the graph structure already known or it's unknown it's unknown yeah it's unknown yeah so our condition uh, are imposed on the true unknown uh, structures. So as long as these true unknown structures satisfy the conditions, we can identify them. So not any alternative, but different structure can lead to the same observed distribution. Yeah. So uh, now I want to talk about how we, uh, how we prove this, uh, a bit of a proof intuition and also connection to tensor decomposition. Um, I know there are experts of tensor decomposition in the audience. Um, so So uh, at first, it may uh, it seems that uh, establishing identifiability in a deep generative model with so many layers and uh, graphs is uh, not a, a straightforward task. And uh, actually, uh, the way we do is do this is to is to actually look at two layer at a time. And uh, when looking at the two layer at a time, we convert the sparse connections between layers to a constraint laying class model or a constraint tensor decomposition. So here is a toy example to illustrate this idea. So for example, we are considering just three observed variables, three uh, gray nodes, and uh, there are two binary uh, latent variables and a deeper uh, latent variable Z. So this is a small pyramid. And uh, we can write out the graphical structure uh, of size three by two in this form, because uh, we know that the first latent variable is a parent of y1, so the first row is uh, one zero. Okay, so uh, this problem, uh, I claim that it can be, if we look at only the bottom two layers, and this problem can be connected to a latent class model with a univariate latent variable. And uh, this is because if we view the latent configurations of the alpha vector, alpha one, alpha two, so it actually ranges from these four possibilities, zero, 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 one. Uh, one zero and one one. So there are four latent classes, but we cannot just flatten these uh, two latent variables to a latent class model without introducing constraints, because the sparse graph between the bottom two layer uh, does introduce a constraint. And the following constraint is an example. So it is that for a latent, uh, so let's let's consider that each alpha one and alpha two are two latent skills. You either have the skill, you lack the skill. Okay, so that's binary. And uh, uh, the Y1 is your response or your answer to a, a question in the, in the exam. 
So uh, you either answer it correctly or incorrectly. And uh, the fact that this uh, first variable y1 has only one latent parent actually means this first question is only designed to measure the first skill. So it's not asking about the second skill. Uh, therefore, you can see that a student with only the first latent skill and an another student with both skills, they would have the same expected performance on this first question, right? So that is the uh, equality constraint induced on the distribution of y by this graph. So that is uh, when uh, y1 has only one latent parent, there will be some equality constraints on the conditional probabilities. So that is the main uh, observation here. So now let's go back to the uh, latent class model uh, graph that we mentioned in the beginning of this uh, talk. So this is a latent class model with a univariate latent variable z, and uh, it has an edge to all the p observed y variables. So the traditional latent class model um, can be actually uh, written like this. This is a probability mass function of y, and it can be written as a mixture model. And inside the mixture model, because of conditional independence, we have a product term. So actually, um, this latent class model uh, is uh, widely used in social uh, sciences, but without constraint, it is not uh, very interpretable uh, when there are a large number of observed variables p. But now let's consider the latent class model is actually converted from a, a multidimensional latent structure model. Then we, a uh, previous observation already implied that we can have some equality constraints. So that's why uh, we will be studying an object called constraint latent class model. And uh, we introduce a binary constraint matrix S. It has P rows corresponding to P uh, gray nodes, and it has K columns corresponding to uh, small K is a number of possible categories that Z can take. Okay, so the previous constraint on the previous slide actually uh, is in the form that um, for any observed variable Y, there are some latent categories that actually give the same conditional distribution of Y, YJ. So this is an equality constraint and the equality constraint is summarized by this binary constraint matrix. So this is a different object than a graphical matrix. So uh, now we can see the connection to tensor decomposition. The probability mass function of the observed variable Y can be uh, actually written as a P-way probability tensor. So it has P-way corresponding to P categorical variables. And uh, for each categorical variable, it can take uh, DJ uh, possible values. So this is actually a CP decomposition of a probability tensor under the latent class model assumption. And uh, this uh, circle represents a tensor outer product. So, Recovering parameters from a latent class model is actually a problem of probability tensor decomposition. And uh, recovering parameters from our constraint LCM also is the problem of constraint tensor CP decomposition. So it constrains certain tensor arm parameters to be equal and uh, with an unknown constraint matrix S. So the uh, identifiability of parameters from such, ident uh, from such latent class model is also related to the concept of uniqueness of such a tensor decomposition. So when is this tensor decomposition unique? That means uh, when is the parameters uniquely identifiable? So uh, a bit more technical object on this side. Uh, so we will uh, consider a certain product between matrices called a cultural raw product. It is a column-wise Kronecker product. So for example, if we consider two matrices C and D, they have potentially different number of rows but the same number of co columns. Then the cultural raw product of the two matrices is actually still uh, a matrix uh, with the same column, but with the rows, uh, row number equal to L1 times L2. That is because each column is a Kronecker product of the respective columns in C and D. So we have a, a longer matrix than C and D. So uh, why is this concept uh, useful? Uh, Indeed, in the, uh, in the probability mass function under latent class model, we can write the previous uh, notation equivalently as a cultural raw product of the P uh, probability, conditional probability tables multiplied by a uh, mixing coefficient vector. Uh, the new vector is mixing coefficient vector for the uh, different components, mixture components, 
And each lambda j is the conditional probability table for the variable yj. Uh, so it has rows uh, corresponding to the different categories yj can take and columns corresponding to the different latent classes. Okay, so actually we can write out the probability mass function of y in this way. And uh, uh, we have a, a non-trivial uh, structure uh, of the constraint LCM. That is, uh, recall we define the constraint matrix S with uh, different columns corresponding to different latent classes, right? So we can actually establish that when different column vectors of the constraint matrix are distinct from each other, then their cartridge raw product uh, actually has full rank. So the cartridge raw product full rankness is very important. As you can imagine, um, if we have a full rank uh, cartridge raw product matrix, it uh, seems possible. If we know lambda j and uh, this cartridge raw product is having full rank, then we can uh, recover the uh, remaining parameters new, right? But even if uh, lambda is unknown, uh, we can still uh, exploit the full rankness of the cartridge raw product under constrained latent class model. Okay, so uh, so without details of talking about uh, why we established that proposition, I just want to uh, mention our result for such a constrained latent class model or constrained CP decomposition of a tensor. So our identifiability conditions for such model is that as long as the uh, constrained matrix S can be uh, divided into three non-overlapping blocks vertically. And each of these blocks uh, contains mutually distinct uh, column vectors. So actually this is a easily checkable condition because it only concerns this binary uh, constraint matrix. So as long as this is true, then we can recover all the parameters, including the unknown constraint matrix from data. Okay, so uh, now we have already understood um, uh, for a constrained latent class model or constrained uh, tensor decomposition, we can um, recover the parameters. Then we can uh, actually use our previous observation that uh, the constraint matrix and the graphical uh, matrix, the dark red edges, are actually uh, just a one-on-one -on -one correspondence to help us get the, the first theoretical results we, uh, I mentioned, uh, which is the uh, identifiability conditions on the graphical matrices. Okay, I, I hope um, uh, I hope this is not uh, too confusing. So, uh, in fact, we can establish that for any graphical matrix, for example, the graphical matrix in this case is a three by two matrix. We can have a one to one correspondence, building a one to one correspondence between a graphical matrix and a constraint matrix, with each column corresponding to each latent configuration of the latent uh, variables. So this insight is exactly derived from our previous observation that if there's any graph, there will be some equality constraints. Okay, so that's our uh, toy example. So using the result that the constraint matrix and graphical matrix are one-to-one, -one, we can translate our conditions on the constraint matrix S to the conditions on the graphical matrix G. Therefore, we arrive at our uh, previous uh, uh, condition. And uh, an additional key insight we rely on when going deeper uh, is that, so uh, by far we have talked about just focusing on two layers, right? You convert the K uh, binary variables to a univariate variable, but actually we can uh, going deeper and deeper one layer at a time. So that is uh, exactly because we consider discrete latent variables and we don't, uh, uh, actually we are very flexible in how the, uh, discrete latent variables are distributed. So thanks to this, we can focus on the bottom two layer at a time, establish identifiability of the distribution of the shallowest latent layer and treat them as if they are observed to go deeper and deeper. So this insight is very important, uh, very intuitive, but it uh, holds only for discrete random variables. Yeah, I know that. So I just wanted to say somebody just said, um, if the full rank condition is violated, um, which layer is it going to get? Is there some structure in which the identifiability is lost? Like, for example, you can still recover the shallowest layer, but things get not identifiable in the deeper layer. Yeah, so um, actually, based on our uh, layer wise proof argument, uh, for example, if the conditions are met for the dark red edges, then the distribution of all the alpha and the conditional distribution of uh, each y given alpha are all identified. 
But if the deeper, like the uh, deeper edges do not satisfy our conditions, then the deeper uh, uh, parameters, the deeper distribution and the deeper conditional distribution uh, are not identifiable. But we can actually, we can always go from the shallowest to the deeper and uh, uh, stop where uh, our identifiable conditions are uh, beginning to be violated. Okay. So a very natural consequence of um, the identifiability result is a posterior consistency. So uh, as long as identifiability conditions are met, then the uh, uh, supposed true, the priors have full support around the true parameter values, then uh, our posterior for the parameters and for the constraint matrix will concentrate around the truth. Okay, so not only that our uh, probability tensor uh, will uh, have a good estimation uh, accuracy, but our estimation of the uh, lambda of the, these parameters will have good uh, uh, estimation accuracy. So uh, now I will uh, go to uh, talk about the methodology question of how to infer the latent structure. Uh, this part will be relatively brief and uh, I will be focusing on a two latent layer example. So in this two latent layer Bayesian pyramid, uh, uh, we specify the, uh, the distribution of each yj given the alpha as a multinomial logistic regression form. So note that for identifiability, we allow for various different distributions, but for estimation, uh, when generating data, we specify this uh, such a distribution. Okay, so you can see uh, the graphical matrix indices G, J, K play a role in the distribution because when alpha K is not a parent of Y, J, then this G, J, K is zero and this alpha K will not play a role in the distribution of Y, J. So this is consistent with the graph. And for the deeper, Z and alpha layer, we uh, just adopt a, a latent class model for this layer. And uh, uh, our previous identifiability conditions are quite general in uh, that they accommodate different distributions. But if we focus on say generalized linear model, this specific family of distribution, we can relax uh, identifiability conditions and uh, we can uh, no longer require each graphical matrix to contain identity submatrices, but only required to contain three copies of uh, block matrices of this form. Okay, so I will see the detail um, and talk about the prior specification. So we adopt a Bayesian estimation approach. And uh, as you can uh, probably already see from the previous formulation, the GJK, the entry is like a variable selection indicators when specifying the distribution of each YJ. So we uh, adopt a, a spike and slab prior and uh, also treat the GJK as random variables because we don't know them and want to estimate them as well from data. Uh, so uh, a more important issue is also in practice, we usually don't know how many latent variables to adopt. Although in theory, uh, in identifiability theory, by far we actually uh, assumed we know how many latent variables, but uh, when doing the estimation here, we adopt, uh, we borrowed idea from a non-parametric Bayesian prior uh, the recently developed uh, cumulative shrinkage process by Lagrimanti et al. Um, in Biometrica. So uh, we actually assumed that the variance for the k latent variable, so we don't assume we know how many latent variables to adopt, but uh, considered that the variance for the k uh, latent variables coefficients actually follows a cumulative shrinkage process. That is, uh, it has some uh, probability of being in the spike, meaning that is a redundant, not useful latent dimension. And it has a remaining probability of being in a slab, which is a useful dimension. And the probability of belonging to the spike uh, following, uh, follows a stick breaking uh, prior. That means when uh, small k, the index uh, increases, it is increasingly stochastically more likely to be a redundant latent column, latent dimension. Okay, so that's the uh, idea. And uh, uh, omitting the details of inference, I just want to point out, we use a data augmentation to develop a deep sampler. So everything has a closed form, posterior, uh, condition, full conditional. And uh, we can also obtain a posterior, a closed form posterior mean for the uh, effective number of latent dimensions. Okay, so that means uh, we have a procedure to infer the latent structure entirely from data. So- I can specify how we keep the constraint of the 
know, three ages has been there. Yeah, uh, thanks for the uh, question. So actually in uh, current uh, implementation, we didn't enforce this constraint, but rather allow the posterior, uh, the sampler to freely explore the posterior space. But we found that uh, when the true parameter structure satisfy our conditions, uh, the posteriors will truly concentrate on those uh, true values without even without uh, considering the constraint. Yeah, but I think it's uh, a very interesting problem to consider enforcing that constraint in sampling. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so here's a simulation study where um, the true structure is like in the uh, last column and uh, we sample size as small as 500 out of the seven possible uh, latent dimensions that we give to the algorithm. So we can specify an upper bound for the number of latent variables. And uh, as we uh, already uh, saw before, a natural upper bound for the number of latent variables is P over three, right? So we can give it uh, seven in this case because there are 20 observed variables and uh, the algorithm can uh, learn the true structures uh, with, uh, uh, with a, a satisfactory precision here. And also when we conduct uh, replicated simulation studies, we can also observe the simulation accuracy of the graphical matrices decrease to zero as sample size increases. And the root mean squared errors of the continuous parameters, including the parameters in the shallower layer and those in the deeper layer. So these parameter values, they have root mean squared errors also decrease as sample size increase. So this is an empirical validation of posterior consistency of our Bayesian estimators. And also, uh, it shows that the computational performance of our algorithm is also uh, satisfactory here. So I also uh, want to talk about a real data application. So we applied our data to a nucleotide sequence data set called the splice junction data set. In genes, there are two regions called the introns and the axons. And uh, the junctions between these two regions are called the splice junctions. So uh, available biological knowledge, uh, shows that, uh, so these junctions can be divided into three types, the EI type, IE type, and the neither type. And this data set is uh, about the splice junction. It is available from the UCI machine learning repository. Um, it contains uh, 3,000 something nucleotide sequences, each of length 60. And uh, each location has a, a, C, G, or T. So it's nucleotides. And this is a summary of the data set. Uh, each row is a nucleotide sequence, and uh, uh, the last column is the data set, is a multivariate categorical data set. And uh, uh, this data set comes with the available knowledge that uh, the type of uh, the sequence is given. But in order to test our method's performance in learning useful latent representations, we hold out this information. We don't use the type information, but just do unsupervised learning for the last column. And we specified an upper bound for the number of latent variables to be seven and uh, identified the five in the posterior. So here's a summary of the estimation results. Uh, for example, here the uh, first column is the estimated graphical matrix that maps how the 60 location loci in the sequence, gen genomic sequence, uh, loads on the binary, five binary latent variables. Okay, so what's more interesting is the uh, estimation result for the latent representations. So here, this is the A hat, is our uh, shallower layer latent representations learned for the sequences, and the Z hat is a deeper layer uh, latent class representations. So if we just uh, do a visual inspection, compare this to the held out biological knowledge of uh, the three types, we can see that it actually uh, matches the, uh, the, for different types of sequences, the uh, latent representations are quite different. So indeed, if we apply a, a rule list classification uh, approach in machine learning, uh, this approach out, outputs very simple rules that deterministically maps the latent representation to the outcome. And this downstream uh, classification has a, a quite high accuracy. So if we plot the uh, confusion matrix, then the diagonal entries uh, indicating the uh, uh, prediction performance of this classifier, a uh, downstream classifier, is actually all exceeds 95%. Uh, percent. So this accuracy is actually matching that is given by the fine-tuned convolutional neural networks uh, in this uh, paper. And uh, uh, although I don't, uh, I didn't include uh, 
uh, figures here, but I also want to uh, point out, we also compared our methods performance with a uh, uh, latent class model. Uh, actually, uh, the latent class models uh, version in uh, 2009, uh, Dawson and Singh, uh, Bayesian, Bayesian version of latent class model. And we also compared our methods performance with uh, uh, shallow, uh, just one shallow latent layer without a, without a pyramid architecture um, performance. And uh, we found that our method uh, is significantly better in uh, downstream classification. So that means our identifiable model uh, truly uh, also holds the power of uh, learning more useful latent representations. So uh, to summarize in this work, uh, we have developed identifiability results for potentially deep graphical models consisting with latent variables. And uh, this identifiability will ensure uh, Bayesian posterior consistency under suitable flexible priors. So uh, the identifiability theory actually provides a reassurance for learning uh, reproducibly latent structure from data because uh, it says that uh, when the model is identifiable, then uh, the parameters, uh, the graphical latent structures can always be uniquely and reproducibly learned from the observed data. And uh, we also proposed a Bayesian method for inferring the latent structure in two layer models. Uh, so uh, extending this method to more than two latent layers uh, is uh, conceptually straightforward because of the uh, conditional independence in our model. And our simulation results show good computational performance. And it also uh, actually empirically va validates the identifiability theory. So because the true latent structures can be uh, consistently recovered from data. So uh, this method also has a, a good ability to identify meaningful uh, latent features in a biomedical data set. So uh, this talk is based on this archive preprint. And if you're interested, uh, you're welcome to check out more details there. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. It was a nice and interesting talk. I'm yes. going to open it up for questions. Yeah. So yeah. I have questions regarding the choice of P1 and P2 in, um, in those things. So you cannot take them too big because of the ideal faculty constraints and you cannot take them too small. So how do you, so are you planning to model that? Or, uh, you know, yeah, uh, I think uh, ideally, uh, so uh, we are uh, hoping to uh, first establish identifiability of these numbers uh, as well as other quantities. And also, uh, I think in terms of estimation, it would be very uh, useful to also model this uh, as random variables. So actually in our current implementation, uh, we already considered modeling uh, an unknown number of latent variables using a non-parametric, Bayesian non-parametric approach. Uh, uh, but like in deeper models, we haven't uh, uh, experimented to see their performance. But I think it's, uh, yeah, it should be an important problem to decide the number of latent variables. That's yeah. a very nice talk. Thank so you. I can see how in the Euclid time sequence, it makes sense that the virtualized is horrible. And I think from the interpretation perspective, it's really great to actually have binary latent variables and horrible latent variables. But of course, in practice, a lot of the lies would be continuous. And a very useful trick would be to dichotomize the continuous variable to separate it into ends and then see the best of the world. Um, do you have any intuition for what will be lost in that process? Would that be a reasonable way to deal with a continuous slide? Okay. Yeah, thank you for the great question. Yeah. Uh, actually, I. Uh, I also wanted to mention that we, uh, we have recently uh, been able to extend our identifiability results for general distributions of Y. Yeah, so, and the key, uh, the key assumption that we make is exactly as uh, what you mentioned is still the discrete or categorical latent structure, because that is the key for us to establish identifiability and to go deeper one layer at a time. But for the observed uh, uh, responses Y, we actually now, uh, we allow for Y to be uh, exponential family distribution. Uh, and, and actually we have a result for non-parametric density of each YJ. And uh, uh, the proof technique is actually a bit similar to what you mentioned. It's like uh, categorization or dichotomization, but uh, that is the theoretical proof technique. And uh, what we uh, obtain in the final, as a final conclusion is identifiability of the entire distribution. Yeah, so thank you for asking that. I was hoping to <laughs> mention this somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. 
So can you tell a little bit about the connection of your work with elements work, uh, apart from the fact that they're dealing with Afghanistan NCMs? Uh, do you mean almond adults? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a great question. So Alman et al's paper published in 2009, Annals of Statistics, was a very important uh, seminal work in um, identifiability of uh, various latent structure models. And actually, uh, uh, our proof technique is uh, also uh, borrowing uh, some ideas from there uh, as like, uh, for example, grouping or concatenating uh, let uh, observed variables into uh, three groups, and then to inspect whether each group of variable has some full rankness. Yeah, so the, in this part, actually, uh, we we brought these important uh, insights from Allman et al's work. Yeah, I, uh, I should include this in my slide. Yeah, but for the constrained latent class part, uh, the cultural product full rankness, that condition was uh, uh, quite non-trivial and uh, specific uh, algebraic structure that only holds for constrained latent class model. Yeah, so it, that part is uh, uh, quite different from uh, existing. So um, in a way your model is kind of a hierarchical CP decomposition model. Um, so there are other decompositions like the Tucker decomposition. And it seems like especially the two layer model you showed looks like you take a Tucker decomposition and again do a rank one factor, a CP decomposition of the core tensor. So, Question one, is that a fair comment? And two, have you compared with some of this uh, collapse stacker type um, decomposition oh. that are out there? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, I think our model uh, still, uh, even if we consider the uh, shallowest latent layer, it is not a Tucker decomposition uh, because um, it is still like we consider it as uh, each configuration, each possible configuration of multiple uh, latent variables is one uh, component and uh, it is a sum of rank one components. So it is CP uh, still, CP decomposition, but uh, actually uh, I think uh, the Tucker decomposition or collapsed Tucker decomposition, as you mentioned, um, those work are, um, are related to uh, mixed membership model, another very uh, important family of uh, latent variable models where uh, each person is not endowed with. So here I consider each person or each subject is endowed with a, a categorical Z and also a categorical vector of alpha. But I think uh, uh, like an analogy with Tucker decomposition and the latent variable model is that each subject or each person is endowed with a probability vector. Uh, and this vector is summing to one, but uh, can have uh, entries that is between one and zero. So that is mixed membership belonging to multiple classes. Yeah. The, yeah, I, I'm aware of that paper. Yeah. Yeah. So I think. Um, um, if it is, oh yeah, I think that's a good point. Possibly if we consider the model uh, given Z, it is not immediately clear to me at this point whether it is a mixed membership structure. Yeah, but uh, my uh, uh, rough uh, impression uh, is that like CP decomposition has better identifiability guarantee. Uh, Tucker, because of that mixed membership assumption, sometimes has a rotational indeterminacy or related issues. So, uh, yeah, we haven't compared it in this work, but we have done some mixed membership model work that is related to Tucker decomposition. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to be curious why there is a three not over that block of partition. Why is not other members? And then also, what's the use to that big partition? Um, so the first question I also I got asked this uh, a lot. Uh, why it is three? Because uh, actually, if we consider there are two uh, observed variables uh, per latent variable, then you can see the joint distribution of these two variables will actually be a, a matrix form. So matrix decomposition is uh, not unique. So I, I'm talking uh, about this uh, intuitively. So if there's two, then actually uh, locally is a matrix decomposition and it is not unique. But when it is three, uh, actually connected to the question uh, being asked about the connection to Allman et al's uh, previous seminal work on identifiability. So the three comes from the fact that uh, as long as we have three, then that is a tensor structure locally emerges. So we can use the tensor decomposition uniqueness uh, and a seminal result in that field to establish identifiability. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
I was originally going to ask our question about like why three. It's a very interesting result. So I was kind of thinking that your proof is going. So you first proved that for two layer networks, like okay, you need this structure, like otherwise you're running your problems. And since the proof is kind of like okay, so you passed do it for two layer and extend from there. So I was thinking maybe that three has some connection with yeah, like the Unity is the two layer Oh, uh, actually, uh, so our uh, our condition of requiring three uh, fewer children per variable uh, applies for arbitrary number of layers. Yeah. So uh, uh, although I'm showing a case with two latent layers, but, but even if there are start with like a two layer and then you kind of show it for two layers and extend it from the induction or something like that. Right? Yeah, yeah. But still, I think the three doesn't come from the two layer, but uh, rather come from the uh, uniqueness of three way decomposition. So a tensor is a three way decomposition. So that three actually restores identifiability in under some mild conditions. And this is also a necessary condition, right? Like you told this three your children condition, both necessary and sufficient. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, so it's not necessary, but it's uh, not too far um, uh, from necessary. It, it's a bit uh, tricky to talk about necessity because for uh, our conditions are uh, general in terms of parametric uh, some, uh, like distributions, right? So if not restricting to a specific family of distributions, it's hard to talk about necessity of the conditions. But for some sub-models, uh, we can relax these conditions to uh, establish uh, necessary conditions or show that some conditions is not far from being necessary. Yeah, but that's a bit, uh, uh, yeah, uh, a bit t tedious. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, let's thank you, Chief. Thank you very much.